to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hey everybody, welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. You may be owed some money, and our hitmaker guest is going to tell you how to collect it. But first, we're just back from Sweetwater's Gear Fest. 16,000 folks converging on this amazing campus in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Two days of gear, education, talent, and just pure audio fellowship. Uh, the level of professionalism in the Sweetwater staff, coupled with being nice human beings, is just off the chain and really okay. rare. Okay. Um, want to thank a ton of you who packed out our workshop. We got to share some information, answer questions, give some prizes, and meet many of you, including the sweepstakes winner from Columbus, Ohio, Max Jones. And we got to give major shout outs to Chuck Serac, the owner of Sweetwater, Chris yeah. Flynn, our personal guy, yeah. Dave Stewart, the Jennifers, you know who you are, Suzanne, Xavier, Austin, and Paula's Seafood. Ooh, <laughs> off the wow. chain. Uh, we were treated first class in every single yeah, way. Yeah. Uh, what we'd advise you is make Sweetwater's Gear Fest an annual event in your calendar. It's really an audio must do. So now we head off to Summer Nam in Nashville. Hitmaker extraordinaire Luke Laird is going to join us, plus his powerhouse wife, Beth. Uh, they have an incredible company and have hits with Carrie Underwood, Luke Bryan, Blake Shelton, Brad Paisley, Lady Annabelle, Eric Church, Casey Musgraves, and a ton more. Beth oversees Creative Nation. That is a absolute growing force in publishing and management in the Nashville area. And if that's not enough, we're going to have super hot Ross Copperman. 19 number one country hit singles like Keith Urban, Dirks Bentley, Kenny Chesney, Darius Rucker, Florida Georgia Line, and many more. Ladies and gentlemen, if you ever want insight into hit songwriting, producing, publishing, management, and everything else, this is the one. We've got this baby packed and loaded, classic Pensado style. When is it? Our session is Saturday, July 20th at 1 p.m., then a meet up with our guests at 2 p.m. right after. Takes place at the Music Center. And our great partners at NAM are letting the Pensado's Place audience in for free. See, we hook you up. We'll probably have some gifts we'll give away too. So you don't want to miss this. How do you sign up? Go to this link you see right below me. When it asks for a code, put in Pensado. Do this ASAP. Get there early. Get a seat. You do not want to miss this. It's going to be an absolute killer. So as if that's not enough... Today, we launch the Axe.io Summer Sweepstakes from mm. IK Multimedia. So we'll have four weeks of winter of this super cool interface. Dave, what, what, I, I saw your reaction to it. Talk about it a bit. Well, I love it. I've been using it. I think it represents an incredible uh, value, incredible converters. You get a JFET input, which means that you can get some of the uh, same harmonics that you would get from tubes. It comes complete with Amplitude 4, and I'm going to do an ITL on it quite soon, quite soon. So Just, I think you uh, you like it a little. I do. Well, it, good. It represents serious quality features and value. Okay, can't beat that. So we're going to have a bunch of winners for that, four straight weeks of it to win. Enter your email, quick, fast, in a hurry, at ikmultimedia.com forward slash pensado. We'll start naming those winners in just a couple of weeks, and we want you to make sure you get an Axe.io. It's from IK Multimedia. Enter right now. So we have lots of information for you, and the easiest way to keep up is to sign up for our newsletter and do us the favor of like, subscribing, and clicking notify. We'd certainly appreciate it. Uh, we saw our good friend Mitch Gallagher at Sweetwater, and we've got yeah. one of his pieces. What do yeah. we have this week? A good one. Mitch is going to talk to us about manual compression, which is a way to get more energy and groove into your vocals. And that's this week's sound advice, brought to you by Sweetwater. Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Welcome to Sound Advice. This time out, we're checking out a technique that I call manual compression, which is basically using automation to control the dynamics in a track. This gives us some advantages over using hardware or software compressors on our tracks. Let's take a look at how it works. Today we're working on a vocal track sung by Nick DiVirgilio. It's on a track called Theodora and Green and Gold off the new Big Big Train album Grand Tour. The section we'll be working on is a high background vocal part that Nick did during the chorus. Here's what the entire mix sounds like. Here's 
what Nick's raw vocal track sounds like. Together for all time set in glass and stone. Let's take a closer look at the track. Again, this is the raw recording, and we can see the dynamics in this section. Together for all time set in glass and stone. In addition to fairly wide dynamic swings, we also have some sibilants here. There's some here leading into this word, and some on the trailing end of this word here. And we also have uh, some noise where he lets go of the final word here. Together for all time set in glass and stone. Now we could apply regular compressor to this track, and we get good results using it. For example, here I have the Fab Filter Pro C2. Together for all time set in glass and stone. You can hear that's really bringing up the sibilance, though. And it's also really bringing up that last part where he lets go of the final word. For another example, I've got a UAD LA-2A on this track. Together for all time set in glass and stone. So again, we can really hear that sibilance is coming up, and you can also hear the compressor working. It's grabbing onto some of those syllables, and that may sound fine. This is a background vocal track. It's not going to be a big deal. But if we really want to get in and optimize what's happening, we can use micro-automation to do it. We'll move over to my automated track at this point. Now, if we watch the fader here, we'll see the automation taking place. Together for all time set in glass and stone. So what I've done is gone in and drawn automation for that passage. Together for all time set in glass and stone. So you can see that I've pulled down the big peaks. I've also dropped down some of the sibilants, those S's and T's and things, and also pulled back in that noise at the end of the last word. This really cleans up the track. Now this allows me to boost the signal up quite a bit, so we're getting more energy out of this vocal as well. We're really having the same effect as if we'd compressed the entire track, but we have much more control over it, and we're not affecting the sound, so you're not hearing the compressor grab different things. Instead, we can custom tailor the automation to make it work perfectly. For comparison, we'll listen to the tracks that were compressed with plugins, and then we'll listen to my manual compression track. So let's set all these to medium size. All right, we'll begin with the raw vocal. Together for all time set in glass and stone. Here's with the fab filter. Together for all time set in glass and stone. The LA-2A. Together for all time set in glass and stone. And the version with manual compression. Together for all time set in glass and stone. Now one of the advantages to controlling the track with manual compression like this is we can still route it through a compressor or an EQ later and we'll get much more smooth results out of it. So let's drop back over here. I have a second track set up where we're feeding through an SSL E channel. I've got just a hint of compression set up here and I'm also boosting a bit on the high end as well as some low mids. Together for all time set in glass and stone. Because the compressor isn't having to deal with those big dynamic swings, it's a much smoother operation. We don't hear it grabbing things, but we're still getting a consistent level out, and we can apply that EQ without worries of having overs. I hope you've enjoyed this look at manual compression or micro-automation. It really gives you a lot of flexibility for dealing with the dynamics in your tracks. Now, there are other things we can do with this as well, and we'll look at those in some future sound advice segments. Thanks for joining me here today at Sound Advice. I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. He's one half of Mini Mafia and a vice president at Transparence Entertainment Group. Please welcome to the place the one, the only. He's not Batman. He's not the Dark Knight, but he is Bruce Wayne. <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> How Bruce, you doing, so, up, man? You did an amazing kind of turn. Um, I've seen a few folks do that, but not everybody does it successfully. As part of the production group Mini Mafia, you established that. Thing yeah. it was from yeah. discuss. Shout out to Dirty Swear. Absolutely, oh, absolutely. Yeah. Couldn't do, couldn't do it without him. And now you've made this transition and actually been doing it for a while as an executive, where you're managing music catalogs, music things, sync stuff, yeah, all kinds lot, of things. Like a lot going on. So 
tell us about that transition, and then and then we'll go into specifically what you do at, at Transparent. Well, I think we've always been doing our own business. Mm-hmm. You know, I think um, it came that time when we kind of worked with every manager, and we didn't want that reputation of being the guys that jumped around all over the place. And um, we were very uh, always kind of like self-sufficient. Yeah, you were very self-contained. We were always self-contained. We only did the things we actually really liked. Mm -hmm. We weren't hopping around trying to get on every project. We had our own studio, Mm -hmm. which was in a house. We we actually took over um, Glenn Ballard's house. Oh, yeah. And then we um, took those studios, took that over. Where he did Alanis Morissette? That whole album. Out in the Valley? That's the best music we've ever made in our life. Yeah. Was it the House in the Valley? Yep, the House in the Valley in Encina. Yep. And then Tricky took it over. Tricky Tricky took it over. Took it over after us. Yep. And then... um, so we were kind of always doing our own business. Mm-hmm. And um, when the industry started to shift, we we were kind of like, what are we going to do now? Mm-hmm. Because again, we were only doing the music we actually really liked. Mm-hmm. So we didn't want to, no disrespect to like Flo Rida and what was going on at that time. Mm-hmm. It's just that wasn't what we did. Right. And we were like, well, you know, music always comes around, I guess, kind of figure it out mm-hmm. from there. Mm-hmm. And then um, we just got into television and film. You know, um, Russell Emanuel, um, he owns um, Extreme Music. Mm-hmm. At the time, um, his partner was Dolph. And uh, Swift had actually done music with them before we were even partners, mm-hmm. like almost 10 years before. Mm-hmm. And Swift was always like, we need to get back here. Mm-hmm. And um, we were like, you know what? All right, let's do it. Now's the time to do it. We're, we're doing really good. Mm-hmm. Things are great. Frank Ocean's taking off. All of these things are happening. We were like, if we're going to do it, now's the time to do it. Mm-hmm. So we were kind of balancing that and doing commercial work. Mm-hmm. Then eventually, we just let go of the commercial work and started mm-hmm. focusing on that 100%. Because mm-hmm. the first year was like a learning curve for sure. us. Because, you know, we we learned easy, like we learned really quickly that Sync has multiple businesses, yeah. businesses inside of it. There's mm-hmm. music libraries, there's uh, commercials, trailers, mm-hmm. television, mm-hmm. film, theme songs, that mm-hmm. kind of vibe. And each one of those businesses are different businesses. Yeah. There's different business models for each. Each one. Mm-hmm. You know, it just each doesn't module. move the same. Mm-hmm. You know, like some people don't know that if you do a song for a commercial, sometimes the the studios won't do it with you if you don't have insurance. Mm-hmm. Because if they get sued, yeah. they want to put it back on you. Mm-hmm. So you need to have at least $5 million in mm-hmm. insurance. Mm-hmm. So we're like, oh, well, we're not going into that business. We're not going in that direction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so take me, take me from... Okay, you wrote a song. Let's say you've written three songs. Now, take me from getting it to the person that can help you get it to the sync. Just take me through the whole process from writing that song to hearing it in a film or TV show. What happens What happens after you write it? There's really no process. At the time when we were doing it, you either knew a music supervisor mm-hmm. or you did it. Mm-hmm. So you'd go through a music supervisor. Are, music supervisor. are they exclusively, exclusively with movies or are they... Um, well, with music handle. libraries, mm-hmm. um, there isn't a lot of music supervision. Like what we would call an A and R mm-hmm. would be like the guy in post, yeah. the guy who's doing the editing, because they have to pull music, mm-hmm. and those deals are usually already done. Mm-hmm. So they can just kind of carte blanche, just go, "We like this, let's move it, let's put this here, let's place this here, let's make what, that happen." You said pull music. Where do they pull it from? So when you're editing, a, when you're I know editing, I'm asking stupid questions. No, no, but... this is perfect. Like when you're editing a show. Um, the, the guy who's editing the show <laughs> needs to use music. Yep. So if you want to use a record from Kanye West, it's too expensive. Mm-hmm. Or the budget may say, we could only use these kinds of songs, mm-hmm. three of these high level songs, mm-hmm. but use that music library. You can use whatever you want in it. Mm-hmm. The deals are already done. Mm-hmm. The fees are already set. The business is already done. Mm-hmm. So when we partner with Extreme Music, Extreme Music is the number one company in that space. Mm-hmm. Okay. So they had a, contracts with every network, every studio for music libraries. So we were like, this is probably the best partner for us mm-hmm. because the deals are already done. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So does that make does that make sense? Well, so now we got it, we got it at, at Extreme Music. Now the guy pulls it from Extreme Music and then puts it in the in the movie or, or puts it in a TV. TV show, yes. And then, how do you get paid? Um, PROs. Most of the the I don't deal know what that means. P- 
public performance. CSAC, BMI. Per, per, oh. Performance rights organizations, oh, your okay. PRO. Yeah, I knew that. A lot of the deals are you don't own your publisher share, you own your writer, writer share. share. Mm-hmm. So whatever comes on TV, it just flows through that every quarter. Just like a re- regular record. Just like right? regular, regular um, records. Most And sometimes, and most of the time, you don't own your master. So it's a one-stop shop. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, like again, if you're doing commercials and film and you know theme songs, those rights aren't associated with. Those have to be all negotiated, and they're all limited. So when you submit something, do you submit it as an instrumental, a separate a cappella, or do you just, in other words, you submit it in pieces like some movies ask us to do from a mixer, or you just it's just no what. We decided to do it very different. We didn't really know how everybody else did it. We just were like, we're going to focus on urban music. Uh-huh. And if we're going to do this and do it great, we want to do it like if we were running a record label. Mm. So we were like... So talent would be a focus. Talent would be songs a focus. Songs would be a focus. Full songs. Mm-hmm. We didn't really focus on instrumentals. That was actually more work than doing a full song. Mm. Because we we thought about our relationships, who we knew. We always had access to upcoming talent. And we also wanted to provide opportunity. We were like, oh, hey, you want to do something you're not doing? All right, let's do this. This would be really cool. There's nowhere else you can actually go for it. Mm-hmm. So we became technically the music supervisor in this space. Mm-hmm. So usually, you know, we would submit the entire song. They go, we like it. This feels good. And then we would package it up like a album. Mm-hmm. Right now we're doing more EPs. And then we would definitely give them all the parts, all the okay. stems, all mm-hmm. the pieces. Mm-hmm. But we would do all of the work. Mm-hmm. We mix it. We master it. Mm-hmm. We we do it all. We give it to them completely done. And that's, that's probably two advantages to that. One is control of the quality of the stuff. Mm-hmm. So it's you exactly. doing because you've got that responsibility to yourselves and to the act. Definitely. And then it's a convenience to the end user because he's like, they'll do it all. Here's the deal. Here's the fee. So when we get it, we get it complete in the way we want it. And then we can utilize it and not have to do more, whether it's a part Definitely. or, or a vocal or... Of course. Right? We, we made a lot of mistakes in the beginning. Of course. So done. it took us a while to kind of figure out what was the best way to do it. And that was just the best way to go about sure. it. It was like, let's control all of it. Let's make it happen. Like I said, in most of these situations, the um, on the publisher side, they don't own a piece of it. We worked mm-hmm. out a situation where creatives can participate, mm-hmm. you know, on the sinks and stuff like mm-hmm. that on that side. We wanted to do things a little bit different, provide opportunity, and everybody feels like it's a fair deal. And then depending on, there's territorial issues in terms of what may have a royalty, what might not have a royalty. Is 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 that part of the process? Is that a, a, a business concern that you look out for when you do these kind of deals? Well, or every, does it not exist? everyone that we work with cannot have a publishing deal. They have to be free agents. Mm-hmm. They cannot be signed to a major record label. They have to be free agents. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And um, that's, again, that's why we wanted to kind of be able to offer something that a lot of independent artists wouldn't have at the time. Mm-hmm. Now, mind you, we started like four or five years ago. Mm-hmm. So... Spotify wasn't Spotify right. five years ago. Apple Music wasn't Apple Music at that time. Right. We were just like, hey, you know, you're putting out mixtapes and you're putting it up, but you're not making any money from it. So, hey, why don't we monetize it for you over here this way? Mm-hmm. And we were still putting music up. Um, we were partnered. We partnered with Empire Distribution mm-hmm. early. Again, nobody was really mm-hmm. working with Empire in that capacity. Mm-hmm. And we were like, hey, we can take your music. We can put it up, distribute it for you. We'll split that 50-50 with you. Mm-hmm. We'll give it a presence. So we were doing things very, 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 very different. And now it's kind of caught up. Everybody's starting to catch up, but mm-hmm. we're kind of like way ahead, you know? Mm-hmm. So, um, yes. You, you guys were were trailblazers. Yeah, but well, before this, previously, what people don't know is that, you know, Sylvia Rome and Merlin Bob mm-hmm. set us up as um, black music for Electra before mm-hmm. um, they defunct. I mean, you know, Warner, I don't know if it was Atlantic or Warner or whatever right. defunct it, but we came out of that situation, that thought process. That's all we knew. Mm-hmm. So we just kind of like, oh, this is just like. It was with Electra, with Sylvia. Let's just right. move this over here. Yeah. Same, same Your own department. And 
Same thing. Got it. And, so, and so, do you actually sign artists and let let various artists uh, contribute to the uh, to the library of music that you have? We don't sign artists. Uh, we keep our deals non exclusive. Mm-hmm. It's only based on the music that you want to put in. Mm-hmm. So it's on a case by case basis. Mm-hmm. Again, we wanted to. We didn't want to have that responsibility of like, mm-hmm. now you're my artist. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We want it to be based on just the success of the music. Mm-hmm. And you were talking earlier about the advantage of having an artist with, with something on Spotify and having a, an opportunity to get a sync. Um, explain that. Oh, it's beautiful, right? Like, so we do, like, say, um, Freeform. Mm-hmm. Um, we do a lot of work with Freeform. So, like, a song gets in Grownish, people watch it, they're like, wow. And then what, what do everybody do? They Shazam, what's that song? Absolutely. Mm-hmm. It's everywhere, you know, whether you're on Spotify, whether you're on Apple, whether you're on Tidal, uh-huh. whatever you may be on, it's like, oh, I can go grab the music right over there. That's where I found it. And that's mm-hmm. where a lot of people are like discovering music now. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, the bad thing with Apple and Spotify and everywhere is that there's just so much information. Yep. It's just, it's just it's so just much. It's not, yeah, it's like if you only go to certain playlists, that's mm-hmm. cool. But with TV, it's just like, I like that. Boom. Mm-hmm. It takes you directly to what you want. Mm-hmm. There's no looking. There's no sifting. So you watch your favorite show. You hear your best music. Mm-hmm. You go find it. Now, in your role at Transparency Entertainment Group, your VP there, neighboring rights is a big part of of, of your world and, and what you oversee. Explain neighboring rights and how that works. Well, um, the best way to explain it is like how I got into it. Okay. You know, um, Dennis Drath, who's a mentor of mine, Sherry Hoffman, she's CEO. Mm-hmm. She's also a mentor as well, too. Maybe like three years ago, um, I sat on a panel and uh, and Dennis was talking about neighboring rights and I didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, what is this? What is that? And since we were doing the panel, he couldn't really explain it to mm-hmm. me. So he said, come to the office and let's, let's talk. So the way he explained it to me, just in a super easy way was like, hey, when you make a song, there's two rights associated with it. You know, with the copyright, there's the composition side, mm-hmm. and then there's the sound recording side. Um, when we say composition, you might know that as publishing. When we say sound recording, you might know that as a master. Mm-hmm. What people don't know is that when a song generates money on publishing, say if you generate a dollar, you also generate a dollar on the master side on performance royalties. Mm-hmm. I was like, what? For real? Mm-hmm. There's a performance royalty on the master? Mm. He's like, yes, the reason why you don't know about it is because in the U.S., you only receive that royalty digitally. But everywhere else around the world, you receive it digitally and terrestrially. Mm. Terrestrially means like if it's playing on the radio, Mm. you get a performance royalty for the master. Mm. You just don't get that money here in the U.S. I was like, whoa. Uh Uh-oh, magic. Where does all of that money go, right? Right. And then he was like, you know what, Bruce, since you're here, um, we have tons of like artists on these unclaimed on our unclaimed list and a lot of them feel like a lot of them feel like um urban artists and i think you know a lot of them he showed me the list i was like oh yeah i know him i know him Mm -hmm. i'll call him right now for you whatever blah 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 Mm -hmm. and then by the time i was done it added up to like maybe say like five million dollars i called everybody I started reaching out to everybody. I was Santa. I was Santa. Absolutely. I was Santa during the summer. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> and, you know, I paid out about like $3 million of it. Mm. Between, and these are all my friends. And they were like, Bruce, you know this is a business, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I was like, it is? He was like, well, you could be an agent here. And to give you a little bit more history of it, Dennis worked for the company called, well, he didn't work for it. He started um, the, the um I don't want to say union, but it's a fund. It's called the AFM, mm-hmm. sag aftra Intellectual Property Distribution Fund. Mm-hmm. Do they advertise in uh, Music Connection? All the time. Okay, I know them. So people mix it up because they think, because they see AFM and sag aftra that mm-hmm. it's a union, but it's actually its own entity. <clears throat> Just the AFM and sag aftra sits on the board mm-hmm. of that organization. Mm-hmm. And um, what they do is they pay performance royalties for non-featured performers. Mm. Non-featured performers are musicians and and background vocalists. Mm-hmm. So in 1995, the law was passed for, you know, to make a performance royalty digitally. Mm-hmm. So when that started, it, it started up royalties. Mm-hmm. So 
anyone who contributed towards the master can now receive a royalty. So even if you're the producer, the songwriter, you're making your money doing how, doing whatever, whatever, the musicians in the background vocals, they contributed to the master. Mm -hmm. So when you contribute to the master, there's a performance royalty. The, AF, the fund is where Dennis realizes, like, wait a minute, who's going to distribute this money? Mm -hmm. So he started it with 87000 I think it was like $87,000 or something like that. By the end of, like, he retired from there, maybe like a year and a half ago, it's worth $100 million in assets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, that's great, right? But what's amazing about it is that if you look at the ratio of how the money is broken up, 50% mm -hmm. of that royalty goes to the major record labels. 45% mm. of it goes to the featured artists and 5% of it goes to the musicians and background vocalists. So that $100 million that we're talking about is only 5% of the streaming money coming in from the performance royalty on the master in the United States. And we're only talking about the digital side. Give us an example of where that uh, breaks down for another country. So in other countries, they all have their own rules. I was kind of telling you guys this earlier. It's kind of like barbaric, mm -hmm. right? It's the wild, wild west. It's the wild, wild west. Because streaming is still a very new thing. Yeah. People think that it's old, but it's still very new. Absolutely. So with publishing, it's had 100 years to get it right. Mm -hmm. You know, your song gets played on, you know, whatever. It goes to Billboard, you know, top 10, 10 weeks, million dollars. Mm -hmm. You could collect around the world. It comes in, you know, every nine months, paid out quarterly. You get the international. The system is, is it's tight. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. Yeah, there's no yeah. problems. Yeah. Neighboring rights is brand new because the master now is worth something. Mm -hmm. And remember, that law was only 1995. We're only in 2019. Mm -hmm. So look at how long it took for it to catch up. And there's no oversight over neighboring rights. There's no tribunal or council saying, here's how we're going to manage this around the world, right? It's territory by territory? It's territory by territory. There's just, there's a, a, an organization called SCAPRA. And I don't know that much about it. I'm not, that's not, that's above my pay grade. Mm -hmm. But there's an organization named SCAPRA that kind of keeps everybody in line. But each person has, each organization has their own situation. Mm. The best way to explain it is in the U.S., we have a uh, sound exchange, mm -hmm. right? So to, to break it down a little bit more, your music is played on Pandora. Then your music is played on Sirius. Mm -hmm. That's where the performance royalties are primarily generated, non-interactive, mm -hmm. is generated there. That money is sent to sound exchange. Sound Exchange breaks it up. 50% goes to the labels, 45% to the um, featured artists, and then 5% to non-featured. And now the non-featured, Sound Exchange doesn't pay it. They pass the money up to the fund, and then the fund pays that out to... They distribute it. They distribute it. So now that process, in the UK, you have PPL. Same scenario. Money gets played, paid on, you know, Spotify or wherever, digitally, non-interactive, terrestrial, BBC. It all goes there. Mm -hmm. Break it up. Same payout. Germany, Switzerland, Japan, mm -hmm. Black, they all have different rates, <laughs> different percentages. And then there's also what we call, um, we, here in the U.S., we call it private copy. So basically, like if say something is played on like VHS or Blu-ray, mm -hmm. there's a set amount of money that's just sitting there that they'll pay. Same scenario. Germany has it. Mm -hmm. So there's like a five to ten million dollars just sitting there as in a fund. And if your name is registered, then they pay it. If not, they keep it, hold it, mm -hmm. and do what they want. I remember um probably two years ago, thereabouts, um folks at SAG had me come over and sit in on a board meeting because they were looking for a more direct way to speak to songwriters and creatives about this money sitting here that needed to be distributed and they needed to find people. So they were looking for different avenues to, it was actually Candace Stewart's husband. Oh, oh Brian. Yeah. I work really close with Brian. I love Brian. Yeah. So Brian had us over and we sat in on a meeting and head of the Grammys was there, Marine, or the pre wing and so on and so forth. And they were trying to take on that issue of how to 
one, get it out to people that there was this fund sitting here and you may have something in this fund. Yeah, every year there's at least $20 million that's sitting there. Yeah, that's, and, that's exactly what came up. And 80% of that money is um, predominantly urban. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And the reason why it's urban is because it's non-union. Mm-hmm. So even though you're not a part of the union, they still have to treat it as if right. union. It has to be equal. Right. And with Urban, we have so many different aliases. Mm. There's so many people attached to one song mm-hmm. and what people are doing. And where we've made a mistakes, so I've made these mistakes, is as a producer, yeah, I can program. I can play keys. I can <laughs> play the guitar. Mm-hmm. I can do all of it. But my only title is producer. Mm. I don't. I don't outline all of right. my my roles. There's no distinction between. There's no them. distinction, so they don't know how to pay you, right. and then there's no credit for you in that space. Yep. And then even if you snap your fingers, or like the best example I give is like Swiss Beats. He's like Showtime. He puts that ad lib on mm-hmm. all of his beats. Mm-hmm. That's a background vocal, mm. right? Mm-hmm. Money so sitting there. you know, and you know, we help find him, connect him to realize mm-hmm. that Jermaine Dupri, mm-hmm. Puffy. All those ad libs on all of those hit records, mm-hmm. like a lot of them don't know that that they're entitled to money because he's puff. He's like, yo, that's what I do. He's right. not realizing I'm not a background vocalist. I'm puff. Right, right. <laughs> like, you know, like, but no, you're missing some money. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're missing some money, bro. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> so, so let's say that an American release generates some funds, and then you mentioned in, in England it's a different organizational name. Would you also receive a separate fund from that organization and from Greece and from Italy here's and Spain? The problem. And- here's, where the, here's where the problem comes up. The, the problem is that there's no reciprocity between each country because um, in the 1960s, there was, um, I forgot what they call it. Man, I'm going to get killed. Um, but I forgot what they call it. Don't kill him. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's, a, it's the Roman Treaty. They had all the, all of the, countries come together in regards to music of, they're basically saying like look we need to like do right by the artists we need to figure this out and they all came together made up these rules but the United States never went mm. to that meeting mm. that, so since they didn't go the United States doesn't receive any reciprocity mm. Mm. so literally Rihanna who's in the Caribbean Roman territory she can record her records and then she can make her money internationally but she may not make the money here yeah, in the U.S. It's crazy. Right? Yeah. There's no over, uh, umbrella organization that can, that can be lobbied to help with this or, or? No, but there are loopholes. Like, so for example, Jay-Z, and I'm, this is why I'm stopping giving out the secrets. Jay-Z, Rihanna, Kanye West, um, Frank Ocean, if you notice, they always record outside of the country. Mm-hmm. So if you're, you're a U.S. Yeah. citizen and you record outside the country, that music can be paid on both sides because oh. you're an American, so you get both. Or if you are a rights owner, where like you're the record label, like Jay-Z, he's a uh, Rockefeller Records, whatever it may be. If you're a rights holder, you control 100% of the money. It doesn't matter where you recorded the record. Mm. You can define, get all of the a rights money. holder for me, because sometimes I think it's, it's who owns the copyright, who owns the That's publishing. It. I mean, is that all a rights That's holder? That's it. Like, like if you are... If you're a record label and you own the masters, if you're a production company, you own the masters. If you're just a regular investor and you own a piece so of the owning masters. the masters and the publishing would be both rights holding? Publishing is, when it comes to neighboring rights, publishing is another piece of the pie. When like, you use the term rights holder. Whoever owns the master. Whoever owns the master. Whoever has a piece of the master. And all the masters that burned up in the universal fire there. Yeah. Is that, that's a problem, right? Yes. It would that's be. It's costing but, people a lot of money. Yeah, but they're technically still the rights owner. So if that music is generating money, they can they collect 100%. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. As long as you own, like right now, if I make a song right now, like this is why the indie artists are in like the best place ever. All the, any artist who's making their music, they control it 100%. It doesn't matter where they recorded the music. All they got to do is get it registered properly. Mm-hmm. And then they can collect that neighboring rights 100%. Well, I was going to ask you, so if you're in our audience and you were watching the show, what is your advice to budding songwriters and producers and so forth? What should they do to protect themselves? Credits. Um, credits are more important than they've ever been. 
and credits are your role. Like if you make the beat and you play the an instrument, you laid a background vocal, you own this record, you know, even if it looks like your name has 15 sentences of everything you've done, put it needs to be 15 sentences because metadata is where it's all at right now. That's right. So that that change that separate that changes everything, you know. Like um, like for example, like uh like Sean Garrett, right? Um, he has records where he produced some songs on um he has credits for producing records with uh Beyonce, right? When you go on Discogs, two of those records say he's one of those records say he, he's a co-producer, another record says that he's a composer, another record, his name isn't even on it, and he's entitled to money. So how do I prove that? How do I get the fund to give him what he deserves? And it's not really his fault, right? It's not Discog's fault. It's not, it, it's just that we're in a time where everything is just changing. It's so all brand new. It's moving really, really, really fast. Well, we recently had people on from uh, the Grammys, from the PE wing, and they had done white papers. Uh, and one of them was on credits and May the Data. And just how important this was for a number of reasons. For protecting music in the future, protecting income streams in the future. Definitely. Being able to get the right music to the right places if you wanted to remaster something or remix something. Of course. The information isn't correct. Like it's, it, often with the show, we do, we talk about sometimes we give people protein, sometimes we have to give them vegetables. <laughs> uh, but the vegetables are often what gets you paid and protected. And so exactly. these these are vegetables that are really super important to the audience to know. Oh man, like um, I feel like musicians are should really be more called entrepreneurs now because that's what it is. Like you you you're automatically a businessman when you make music, businessman, <laughs> businesswoman, automatically. I, I'm laughing because I recently, literally, last two weeks ago. I give a lot of talks to Ohio State University because they have a program out here. Okay. And one of the first things I said to them was that you're all entrepreneurs. You're all entrepreneurs. Whether you now. want to be or not, not. And if you don't know you're to think that way, that. yeah. And you have to at least think that way and be protective of what you have to do and also be proactive. But to your point, I also think that there's a lot of overwhelming information coming at people. Don't you think? Yeah, it's, it's you know, um, like this is why you guys are like incredibly important. Because mm. even the organizations that are out there that are responsible for the money, they don't even know how to get the information to the people that they're supposed to pay the money to. Mm -hmm. That makes no sense to me. That's mm -hmm. like being a record label and saying, hey, I don't know how to <laughs> get your music <laughs> in, in, in the store. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, then why are we even, why are you even charging? Why, why, why are you even a record label? Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, it's things are just changing, you know, the fund. In their defense, I can literally say that they were only paying guitars, guitar players, keyboardists. Then hip hop blew up. Oh, none of that there. <laughs> Not a lot of it. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, yeah. you know, it's just different. It's just a different way of how music is being made. Mm -hmm. And I think that in the urban space, we get like, you know, penalized for that, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, and this, and this like education has actually become more important than it's Critical. ever been needed before, Critical. right? Like actually the education actually is the money. Well, and we're involved in a technical revolution. And when things evolve that fast, for instance, in between neighboring rights and the other things, even in stuff that you do in the sync space with made music, are you also having to monitor or govern places like YouTube or social media networks where music may appear. Yeah. Is that still wild, wild west? What, what's... It's not the wild, wild west, but it just goes back to education. Like, you know, we'll tell a writer like, hey, we need your IPI number. Mm -hmm. They He's send like, us... What? They send us... They, I don't even know what they send us. Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes it's like... <laughs> it's like, it'll be like the member... The membership... The member ID. Be like, no, no, no. It's this. Mm -hmm. And this is where you have to go to get it. And then, but it forced us to kind of step it up too. Like it made us be like, now when we, you want to get a business with us, this is, this is what we, this need. is how we do it. This yeah. is what we need. These numbers, you're going to find it here, 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 and here. Cause we realized the more information we gave them and the more we educated them, the, the one, the better the entire process of delivering the music. The easier, and the easier your job is. Easy our job yeah, is, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. If, uh, let's say, uh, let's say if I was, 
if I did a particular job on a record, let's say I'm the producer, and all of a sudden I see my name nowhere, is there recourse? Is there something you can do to to, to prove that you were? Because because we, right right now, uh, Herb and I every week we have to look up. Well, we don't have to look up, but we look up the credits for a lot of our guests. Okay. Boy, it's torturous. <laughs> I mean, it, it's right. It's hard to find a lot of credits that 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 exist for even even famous people sometimes. Well, is, is there a recourse for that? I mean, can you submit it to an organization for approval or? Yeah, I I can't really answer that. I mm -hmm. think it's more like. I think it's hard for me because I'm a little more knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. I know more people. Mm -hmm. So I think there's things that I can do to find things. I think mm -hmm. the problem is really for people who aren't that knowledgeable. Mm -hmm. Like, right. for example... Um, would this be something you would do for your clients? Yes. This is something we would do for our clients. But it, it gets really, really tricky because we, we want to be a, be a boutique agency. We don't want to just grab every and anyone. We want to make sure that we can actually do the best job for you. Mm -hmm. And sometimes... It may be like I, I, it may be better if I go, hey, you know, you can just do this and this and you're good. You don't need to pay me. You don't need to pay my company for that. Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, thanks, Bruce. Mm -hmm. Some people would be like, sign you up and just trying to nickel and dime everything. Mm -hmm. well, we just don't have the time. We don't we don't we don't have the energy or the manpower, you mm -hmm. know, so it's just more of like an educational space. That's, mm -hmm. that's why being here is so important. Like mm -hmm. it's like getting the information out there mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we're trying to figure out how to like create the content as well, too, to get it out there. It takes time. Like, what am I spending more time doing? Being in front of a camera, giving the content, or actually the clients that we do have doing the best job possible, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like a give or take. But in regards to recourse, what you're saying, Dave, like, um, what people don't know that is when that money's sitting there for five years, if you don't claim it, they're going to disperse that money evenly across amongst the entire everybody. fund amongst everybody. So Dilute people it. who aren't entitled to your money will get it. Mm -hmm. So, so what we will focus more on is like, how can we prove that? Like, how can we prove who yep. this person is? Yep. And we just went through this big, um, I don't want to say a fight with the fund because they're just one source of where, of, of mm -hmm. people that we're paying, but mm -hmm. it was a really, really good exercise. Mm -hmm. So now we can do things we couldn't do before. So before they wouldn't count a producer. Now we can count a producer, mm -hmm. but then, you know, a producer can't vouch for another producer. Mm -hmm. Like there's all these little nuances and when it, it's some, in some cases it doesn't make sense, but mm -hmm. in some cases it does because it just keeps everybody on up and up on just making things happen. If you are curious about whether you have money someplace, where do you call to find out where it may be? Do you call SAG after? Do you, is there, is there a methodology for somebody who says, Oh, you taught me something. Now I want to go find out if I'm due money someplace. Where would they go? Um, the best thing I can say for your show is, I don't know if you guys will post it oh, up. Oh, not even for our show. Just let's just, say there's a musician out there that, um, oh, well, let me back up. There's so if many, there's some money for our show, <laughs> <laughs> we need to talk and we can do that off camera. Uh, well, what I meant to say, like, if, you know, if it, it's kind of hard to kind of like... Um, systemize like that to mm -hmm. say, hey, if you think you have money missing, you know, you know, you do this, 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 and this. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's really about what your role is, you mm -hmm. know? Like, if it, it's like... Um, if you're a background singer, would the SAG after place be the you place You can be a background go? singer. Mm -hmm. You can go to the um, AFM SAG after distribution fund, go to their website, uh, which is afmsagafterfund.org, mm -hmm. and they have an unclaimed list, literally. You right. can just go look at the list. Right. They have that there for um, background vocalists mm -hmm. and musicians. Mm -hmm. That's one. If you, there's another fund that's called um, the Filmmakers, Film Musicians <laughs> Secondary Markets Fund. Damn. <laughs> and again, they have an unclaimed list and that's for individuals who, who may have, you know, music in television and film outside of the country, here, it's more of an audio visual thing. It's mm -hmm. not so much, um, it's not so much focused on, um, non featured performers, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like it's so many different layers. I think the, the number one thing is to kind of understand what your role what is and who you are. Is, what category you, you fit category in. What category you fit in. Mm -hmm. And then, then that'll help you figure out how to path. figure out your search. Right. Cause there's so, there's a lot. 
Right. right like, right, right. I give you an example. There's one, I won't say his name, but there's a very, very successful music producer who started off as a, as a musician. And he was everybody's musician. And then he worked his way up, became a huge producer. Next to you know, um, he's had music in everything in every field. Mm. But because he's a music producer, they don't credit him for all the musician stuff that he did mm. in the past and then vice versa. Mm. So crazy. his titles are like in the thousands. So how do you... He definitely has money out there, right. but... He's done so many different things with so many different people that it's kind of mm. it's kind of hard to do it without like looking at it and really having a, an in depth conversation. Is the complexity intentional or is the complexity accidental? No, it, technology. It, it's cause, technology. Because there was a time when the complexity was used to hide things from us, you know. Uh, I, I will say that I think that they don't want to pay us. I will mm. say that, mm. especially um, on the urban space, because it's too complicated. It's like it's a lot of work mm -hmm. and you're doing work. If you're doing work that you're not used to doing, why would you want to do it? I see. And especially if you don't understand it. Like if I tell you I'm a music producer and they're going to be like, and I'll be like, hey, I, I played the keys on that and I did this. You'd be like, no, you're the music producer. You'd be like, no, in the rock world, it works like that. Mm -hmm. The music producer in the rock world usually doesn't touch anything, mm -hmm. right? In right. the urban space. Yeah. We, we touch it, the, like the, we make it happen. The producer in certain genres are more like a director and they're directing components and but, different specialists. But if you don't understand the culturally, right. how could you know how to move forward? Mm -hmm. So then now you, now your, your job is in jeopardy. Uh, and I was going to say, I think there's double jeopardy. There is your job is in jeopardy because you don't understand culturally, but then there's just the specific of the roles. Producer, musician, background singer, you know, whatever it may be, you have to know what you did and where you did it and what you're entitled to and where. But but I will also defend it, right? Mm -hmm. I'll defend them at the same time, too. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Like, some of my friends say, oh, man, you know, in hip-hop, you know, we're the producer. They should just change those rules. It shouldn't be like this and be like that. I'm like, you don't want that. You don't want them to, you don't want <laughs> no them to do that. It's less money. Yeah, you'll make less money. Absolutely. So you want the roles separated. Yep. You have to step it up yep. and, you know, and, you know, add your credits and whatever you think you're entitled to. We mm -hmm. need to start getting on top of your business. That's mm -hmm. it. You know, mm -hmm. that's what it is. And there can be recourse, but maybe not for everything. Mm -hmm. But you can start the process. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like, and make things make sense. Is the laptop considered an instrument now? Hell yeah. Good. Yeah, definitely. Because it truly is. It is. It's, it's, it's your screen on your MPC. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then, you know, in the future, laptops will be old royalties <laughs> as artificial intelligence kicks in. Of course. In. Uh, you of know, course. I mean, well, I, I, I'm halfway kidding, but the other reality is as technology continues to move forward, you just don't know what's going to be qualified as something that creates something in the future. And where does that, where does that go when it creates money? To add on to that, right? A lot of these companies, a couple of years ago, they started doing royalty free samples, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't think those, we're going to be hits. Mm -hmm. Now they're hits. They're, hits. they're coming after you. Absolutely. And they're suing you. Absolutely. But it was it's royalty free. Absolutely. Well, wh why are you coming after right, me? Right, yeah. We yeah. should be entitled to that because of mm -hmm. we did that originally. Mm -hmm. You got your check already, Th right? Things change. But if they were smart and they understood what we're doing in regards to neighboring rights, it's a sample, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's contributing towards the master, right? Mm -hmm. You were a musician on that when you played that, right? Mm -hmm. Cool, register your titles. You got some money out there for you. Mm -hmm. So instead of trying to go after that producer who got the hit record off of it, and, you know, he paid his, he's paying his monthly subscription mm -hmm. to use, you know, these royalty-free samples, mm -hmm. the royalty, whoever's creating those, those musicians creating those, producers, whoever, they can make money on the other side and get that royalty mm -hmm. forever. So you just have to do us a favor because this is going to continue to evolve, <laughs> yes, right? Yes, it is. So you got to come back and keep us up to date. Will you do that? Of course I will. And if there's a role that we can play in getting the word out or talking to people. Oh, definitely. Because I think it it's not only important, I think it's critical. I think yeah. that as the evolution Absolutely. evolves, there are winners and losers in the game that ha it's changed. And we're we going to we're, we're make like a huge push on the content side and getting the information out and work really closely with like, like our girl Christina over at um, ASCAP, mm -hmm. um, Moya, who used to be at ASCAP now is a Fender. Like mm -hmm. those are like allies, right? Mm -hmm. And we're really teaming up with, 
with them and you guys mm -hmm. and really um, want to bring you guys up to speed mm -hmm. and figure out how we can all make money together at the same time, mm -hmm. too, helping people. Like, it's a business. Always up for that. Exactly. So we're open to figure out how to incentivize everyone to get the information out. That's how it's going to get out faster. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then kind of figure out how to make it happen. Um, you know, it, so... It, 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 I, when we met with SAG, I think they did a little sponsorship with us, but there was so much more to do and we were talking about ideas and stuff because... It takes one consistency, so the so the message gets through. Oh, definitely. And then the easy way to explain things, and that kind of repeated thing before people start to lock in and go, "Wait, this applies to me," which is why we wanted to have you on the show and focus on this applies to you to our audience. And so oh, definitely. Forth. And, and now you've got some of that information, so you will come back and share with us. I will come back. I think this is great for the culture um, across the board. Absolutely. And. Um, and let Anything. us know if we, you know, if we need to sit down and try to figure out what we can do together. Oh, to, definitely, that's already all happening. Right. We started. Right. We're just right. doing cool. it on. We're just doing it on TV. This is just the introduction. We're doing it on the tube. <laughs> all right. So DP, take us home. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Oh, no problem, brother. Absolutely. A Thank you, man. Oh no. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. It's a pleasure. Oh man. Thank you. Um, you know, um, technology is a beautiful thing, but it, it, it always brings with it change, and I think sometimes. Uh, as humans, we're a bit designed to resist change. And I think uh, fighting that is in today's world is a, is a complete and total necessity. Um, there's information online. I've looked some of it up myself. Uh, it probably is the time to make yourself aware of all these new technologies and how to get paid on all the various ones. We'll see you next week.